getting us prepped and ready to really break loose, so thank you this morning. And uh, for all of you here today, good to have you with us. Uh, we're starting a two-week series um, that is uh, entitled, you know, uh, What Do You Do With What You Have? And uh, this week it will be me. You actually get a chance to hear Pastor Daniel, and I'll talk to you about that in just a minute. But for those of you who are joining us online, as you can see the graphic there, please uh, find a way to sign in in the chat. And if you can't, there's a text uh, number up there that if you could just please um, just let us know through a, a, a text who's with you in that. So uh, we're going to stand and we're going to worship. If you're at home, you can stand and worship. And, you know, if you're online and you hear something good in the worship or the message or something, you're welcome to just keep on talking all through the chat. So stand and uh, worship with us today.
throughout my history Your faithfulness has walked beside me The winter storms make way for spring In every season from where I'm standing I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. Help me remember.
Go ahead and grab a seat, and as you contemplate those words today, you know, sometimes um, all our, our, our walk, our Christian walk, is kind of becomes all consumed with what can God do for me. But uh, we're going to take a look this week and next week at, you know, what do we do with what we have? And uh, we're going to take a look in the scriptures uh, this week, and uh, uh, next week uh, you'll hear from uh, Pastor uh, Daniel uh, Surratt. Um, if you want to, yeah, here's Pastor Daniel right there. Pastor Daniel uh, came and uh, enabled me to just stay here. We looked to hire somebody out at Lifehouse. I listened to 10 minutes of his first message, and I, I knew he had it. You know, so you're going to get an opportunity to hear from uh, Daniel. So um, uh, the next week, just make him feel welcome. Uh, thank him that now that uh, you don't have to share me with another church, you have all of me, which I'm sure you're so glad about. So. We're going to do something a little different with giving this week also. If somebody invited you here, they did invite you here to get your money. They're hoping that you hear something and receive something from the Lord today. But we are going to let our ushers walk forward. They're not going to pass the basket. They're just going to hold it. And uh, uh, if you, you want, there's a basket back there to put it in. But we've just been missing so many different people in that. We're going to let them do that. So if you guys want to come forward now, and as soon as the song begins, they'll just walk to the back. If you have something, just uh, you'll just reach across. Come up here. Start up here so that they know and see. Thank you so much. All right, worship team, take it away. <laughs>
Bow your heads with me. That's some pretty bold words to sing. Giving you permission, Lord, speak what is true in our hearts and in our lives. We give you permission. Speak to us. It's a song that uh, definitely ponders in our hearts, and it's a song that we're familiar with, but it's a song that we got to continue to make sure our hearts are right and to sing before you. May you speak what is true to my heart, to our heart here. May we not worry about the person, left or right, or whatever it might be. We give you permission. Say one thing to us today. Something that we can put into practice. Something that will make us more like you. We just let you know that if you speak, we will promise to obey. We pray in Jesus' name. Good to have you folks with us today. Sandy's going to come and share something real quick with you. But for those of you who are at home, we're taking the Lord's Supper today. And uh, you're welcome to get some bread and to get some juice and uh, get ready to join us towards the end of the, of the, the message here. It's all yours, Sandy. Good morning. I apologize that I have to read this. I wish I could say it from my heart, but it'll never come out. Um, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says... Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. As I reflect on my last week, month, year, I think of the person that says, I'm a Christian, but I don't need to go to church. This church, Lifeline Church, spurred me on with much love and supported me through prayer, text messages, more prayer, phone calls. Did I mention prayer? We have an amazing prayer team that extends through the entire church. I just don't know how someone, anyone, gets through what I've been through without a, without a faith in God through Jesus and a church family. The prayer support I had over the last month and a half can only be described as in Philippians 4, 6, that peace that surpasses all understanding. I can't name you all, but I want to thank each and every one of you that has been there for me through the most difficult year of my life. I love this church family. I just want to close with Galatians 6, 2. Carry each other's burdens in this way. You will fulfill the law of Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. And maybe you uh, are new here. Uh, Sandy lost her husband, uh, and that's what she's referring to. So, All right, what do you do with what you have? Watch this little clip with me, and we'll see if we can figure it out.
All right. I don't know if how many of you have seen the movie Up, but uh, here's actually a picture of, uh, of uh, yeah, what was her name? Edith Mansfield, Seattle. They actually watched a documentary on it, how uh, she wanted to keep her home, was actually offered up to a million dollars, uh, but they just built in uh, and all around it. And that's kind of what the, uh, the movie was based on. But in the movie, you have Carl, you know, and Mr. Fredrickson, and his wife Ellie passes away, and uh, Carl is left, and he just, his house is in the middle of everywhere, and they're, they're trying to offer him money, and they're trying to get it out of the way, and of course, he becomes good friends with a young man named Russell. Now, Russell has something in life that he has to accomplish. He wants to be the best he can for the wilderness. Boy Scouts version of I guess it is, right? And he's got a badge that he's got to fulfill. Now, at the top of your notes, if you're new, pull out your smartphone, pull out your uh, paper notes over there. I have, what in the world are you doing? This is exactly what people were saying to Carl. What in the world are you doing? They've offered you hundreds of thousands, and eventually, from what I understand in the original uh, story, uh, a million dollars. What in the world are you doing? And then you would, might even say to, to Russell, Russell, what in the world are you doing? He's, he's a crab. He, why would you go find somebody that's a little nicer to get along with? And they end up on an adventure because Carl wants to end up and he wants to go to uh, Paradise Falls in Venezuela because that was his dream along with his wife. And I digress, right? What in the world are you doing? You know, that's a, the phraseology that lots of times people say when something's wrong or something's backwards or something like that. But I don't know if you've ever thought about the fact that maybe God doesn't say it this way, but would he ever say to you or to me, what in the world are you doing? What in the world are you doing with what I've given you? You know, what do you do with what you have? If you've ever gone kayaking, you know, there's a certain way to man maneuver and to manipulate as you kayak, you know, you paddle on one side, the other side, if you tip over in the rapids, you know. And as you get through life, there is a way that we are to navigate. There's a way that we're to get through it. And so what in the world are you doing? I want to talk to you about a couple different things today. And then we're going to have the Lord's Supper. Now, if you, didn't, if you came in and somehow got passed and you want to take the Lord's Supper, if you don't want to, we understand that. But if you want to, uh, you had to get one of these. And in a little bit, Tracy, we'll just see if people don't have them before we take the Lord's Supper, they can take it with us. So let's just jump right in. You know, what in the world are you doing with your free gifts? What are your free gifts? You know, people say, you know, Evan, you know, you got to know and understand in life there's no such thing as a free ride, a free gift, Right. I mean, haven't you received things that you've done nothing about to get? You didn't earn it. Maybe you didn't deserve it. You didn't even know it was coming. And so as you take a look at Isaiah 42, verse 5, I think this will help us paint a picture of what in the world we are doing with the number one free gift that we've been given. Isaiah 42, 5, this is the New Living Translation. God, the Lord, created the heavens. Now, this word here means the skies, and uh, this isn't the heavens, heavens. This is the skies, and this is the, uh, the star constellation, in the galaxies, right? So this passage of Scripture refers, first of all, to something you didn't get to be a part of. But when you were born into this life, the skies and everything about them and the sun and everything about it, you get a benefit from. You did nothing to create the skies, but you and I, we kind of tend to walk around, enjoy it, whatever, you know, you plant, you know, you reap, you know, a lot of what happens in our life happens because of the, the heavens, the skies, the atmosphere, and the star galaxies. He created the heavens. He stretched them out. That's a picture of just putting them all out in place. They're stretched way out there. He created the earth and everything in it. You know, what have you done to put everything in the earth that you and I enjoy? What have you done to make sure Lake Erie has walleye in it? What have you done to make sure that there's gold in the earth for people to mine? What have you done? What have I, semi, can take anything that we get out of the earth. What did you do? What did I do? What did we do to make sure that it's there? And then read on. He gives breath to everyone, life to everyone who walks the earth, which is a picture for enjoying the earth, walks and enjoys and does and, and uh, goes in and out and just is fulfilled with, with earth. Everything about your life was a gift. 
Everything about your life, my life, is a gift. Air that we breathe, what we enjoy, everything. And you have a physical life, and you have a part of you that is eternal also. And so if you take a look at the physical life that was given to us as a gift by God, while you were in your mother's womb, Psalm 139 says God was creating who you are, what you were going to look like, the gifts and abilities that you were going to have. God was working on that. The Bible says that to us in several different places. One of the most famous is Psalm 139, right? You know, the skills that you have, the abilities that you have, you know, you can hone them, but you didn't initiate them. You talk to some different people, you know, they're, they're very good with numbers. I am not, right? You know, they don't let me touch things in the financial area around here. If you ask me a financial question, I'm probably going to give you the wrong answer, right? It, it, maybe you're athletic or maybe you're mechanical and you have the understanding. You can, when you were a kid, you took things apart and you were able to put them back together. Maybe you're good at solving problems, right? Maybe you, I talked to somebody the other day, I said, how would you do on an assembly line with something that's mundane and repetitive? And they said, yeah, I would do pretty good with that. I mean, that would make me want to just jump off a cliff. But that's, that's what makes the world go round, right? Uh, we were in a restaurant. I was with Jeff, and this, this little kid turned around and started talking to Jeff. I don't know if he was a year and a half. He's just carrying on a conversation with Jeff, which, you know, same level there, Jeff. Where are you at, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> and he basically, how often do you see a little kid turn and talk to a stranger? We try to tell our kids not to do that, but some just have that ability. Some just have that gift. Maybe they'll be a great salesman. You know, I, I don't know, right? Temperament and personality, you know. Uh, maybe you're good with music, and maybe you're good with kids or adults, you know. You have a good eye, and you're creative, all kinds of different things. We can sharpen our skills and abilities, but they did not initiate with us. You and I have the free gift of life in the physical realm. We have it, you know, personality and temperament. There's people here, you're, you're melancholy, you know. You're kind of like, uh, so, you know, like Eeyore. You know, in and, and Winnie the Pooh, and some of you are outgoing, and some of you are quiet and shy and introspective, and some of you answer quickly, you know, like I think about Peter, and, and then stick our, we stick our foot in our mouth. And some of you, you need the next day to answer. <laughs> My good friend Candy, right? You have physical abilities that have to do with physic, your physical being, your uh, emotional being, and then you have an eternity, you have an eternity that was given to you as a gift. Where you spend it is up to you. Now, you might want to write this down because most people think most people go to heaven, but according to Jesus, in Matthew, the 7th chapter, verses 13 and 14, many, many, many people go through the wide and gate that leads to destruction, and very few find the narrow gate, which is Jesus only. You have eternal life. You, you're going you're gonna to spend s eternity somewhere. I don't know what eternal material is like, but you have it. When you were born, you had a beginning. You will have no end. And if you were God and you gave the breath of life to everyone who walks on earth, wouldn't you want somebody to use that free gift in a way that was somewhat honoring to the one who gave you that gift, if, if that was you? I mean, when we realize the free gift of life that God has given us, we should ask ourselves, what does God want me to do with what I have? When you and I stop and contemplate that, we tend to live life for self. That's the one pressure that Jesus has put on us our entire lives. Don't live your life for yourself. I didn't. If you want to save your life, you will lose it. If you will lose your life for me, you will find it. Number two. What are you doing with your free gifts? What are you doing with your responsibilities, right? When you have gifts and free gifts and somebody's given you something, you can spend it all on yourself or you can use it to help other people. I mean, how do you teach someone to be responsible, right? You give a kid a chore and you want them to be responsible. You say, if you do your job and you teach them how to do that job well and right, not just like, you know, my dad said, rake the leaves and you leave half the leaves there, you know, and it's just, no, do the job right and then, You'll be rewarded, you know. Maybe you get allowance. Maybe you get paid for it, but it's got to be done right. We, several years back, many, many years back now, I can't remember, we were talking about it the other day, you know, we had talked about getting a dog. And getting a dog, we thought to ourselves, what do we, you know, if we're going to get a dog and you kids want a dog, you're going to have to be responsible for the dog, right? That means 
not letting it poop in the neighbor's yard back there, right? That means picking it up, you know. I was talking to somebody the other day. They said in the snow, whenever the dog pooped, they just kick snow over top of it come summertime. Woo, fertilized. You, you got to feed it. You got to give it water and on and on and on. You want something. You want to take care of another life. You be responsible for it. How do we become responsible for the free gifts that God has given to you and to me? We have to be responsible, according to Malachi, the second chapter, verse 15. Has not the one God made you? A re- re- uh, repeating what has already been stated. You. Is your life consumed with you and your mind consumed with you? Has the one God not made you? You belong to him. Here it is in body and spirit, right? Physical and eternal. You belong to him. And what does the one God seek? Great question. What does he want? Godly offspring. Godly offspring. He is looking for, on this earth, people who will recognize him as God, who will live their life for him, who will say to themselves, I want to live godly. I want to live holy. It is beyond my mind how some people can teach that the Bible doesn't call us to live godly and holy. I know we put a picture in our mind that, you know, godly and holy is something we can't obtain. Yes, we can. Every time the scripture says to you to do something, how you're supposed to act, what you're supposed to behave, and you're supposed to respond, and you do it, you have lived God's way, which is righteousness, which is godliness, which is holiness. And the Bible says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Without an attitude that says, I want my life to be godly and reflect that he's given this to me, you won't spend an eternity with him. Uh, you search the scriptures. I mean, as God has given us the gift of life, doesn't he have the right to request that we live our lives in a way that reflects him? Don't we want our children to reflect us, at least the good parts of us? You must take responsibility for the life that he wants us to live. You have to take responsibility. I have to take responsibility. He seeks godly offspring. And if you haven't realized God wants you to live holy, start today. Start to strive today to live a holy and a godly life. Wake up in the morning and find a passage of Scripture. Romans 12, 1 and 2, you know, that God has said to you, he's seeking uh, somebody who will offer themselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That's a, that's a great passage of Scripture to put somewhere to say, today I will live this way. I offer my life to him. I uh, talk to a lot of people, and it happens in our family an awful lot about, you know, seeing pictures of the kids and the grandkids on cell phones. You know, look at this picture, look at that picture, you know, send just the most amazing pictures, you know, proud of. And then I saw yesterday a bunch of people were graduating from Madison and people that are graduating and people taking out, look what they did and they're showing it. And I just wonder if God had a cell phone, if he'd want to show a picture of me. If God had a cell phone, would he be wanting to show anybody, hey, look what Evan is doing. Look what Rick is doing. Here, here, let me show you how proud I am. I I got him here on my cell phone. I I put up on Maria's um, cell phone on her screen page a picture of me (laughs) with Harper, our grandchild. And she's like, what did you put a picture of me up there for? But she hasn't taken it off yet, number one, because she doesn't know how. (laughs) Number two, because it's got a picture of Harper, not me. If God had a cell phone, would he be showing anybody you? Would he be showing a picture of of who you are? To be godly means to look for what God wants, his interest. Oh, we always want the highest interest return on our money. Why is it so bad that God would want the highest return on interest in you and me? Philippians 2 in the New Living Translation, verse 3 through 5, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look only uh, out only for your own interests, right? We want big interests, but take an interest in others. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. He had an interest in others. He had an interest in others other than himself. 
It's what we know, it's what we love, and it's why we've been redeemed. And our attitude's got to line up with Christ's. And his attitude and his interest is other people. He cared about others. We have to care about them. Just open the scriptures and find how many different places the Bible tells us to care for the hurting, to care for the needy. You know, those who are taken advantage of, widows, you know. Sandy Brown's message, you know, her, 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 her story today and what she said today was how people took care of them. And people took care of Gary and Sandy and did different things for them that were anonymous. They don't even know who did it. You know, taking care in the scriptures of those, you know. I, I'm pretty bold and I'm pretty forward. I said, you know, I said, Sandy, are you going to be okay financially? I just asked. Because I ask every widow and every widow, I ask, how are you doing? You're going to be okay, boom, 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 boom. So, you know, we had a conversation about that, and she'd be living in my garage next to my week. So, no, she's going to be she's gonna be in great shape. I, I, I hooked her up. I gave her a name, give her some, you know, information. We help each other. We help each other. You know, uh, we have connections. You know, our famous phrase in our family is, is, hey, I know somebody. We know somebody. Through the kingdom of God, we know somebody. You have responsibilities is what you have. When we take the Lord's Supper today, it is a reminder of what Jesus did. It is a reminder that he was teaching us to give our lives for others. We remember the body and the blood of Jesus, not just to remember to Jesus, but to remind us what I'm supposed to be doing. God is teaching, is trying to teach us what it means to be responsible to him for what it is that he has given to us. What are you doing with your responsibilities? What are you doing with what you have as a follower of Jesus Christ? And then number three, what are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your time? It encompasses everything. And if I was to be honest, this is the one area that I like to guard more than anything else. This is the area that I don't like to be interrupted. Jesus, don't interrupt me with my time. I got plans. I got plans, you know, if any of you, you work, you work long, there's times you, you want your time to yourself. Uh, I don't know if any of you seen the movie with uh, Morgan Freeman and Jack Nicholson, Bucket List, right? People have bucket lists, and it's about two guys who, this, you know, in the hospital meet. They, they're both, their lives are going to be shortened because of the illnesses that they have, and there's one super rich, and one is just a broke mechanic. Sorry, I didn't, sorry, Jim, it's just the way it is, you know? And the two of them come together, and they go on a venture to fulfill what they want to do in their life. There, there's a foundation called Make-A-Wish Foundation. We actually saw a movie on how that came about, and it's about children with terminal illnesses who want a, a, have a wish, and all kinds of people do what they can, whether it's athletes or whatever kind of adventure it is, that they get a chance to do that. You know? And so whether we know it or not, we only have so much time to live. You may not be Morgan Freeman, and you may not be Jack Nicholson, and you may not have been diagnosed, but you have been diagnosed. You are terminal. You're terminal. Your time may be a little longer, a little shorter than somebody else's, but you have been diagnosed with a time frame. And you and I are responsible to make sure that time frame is spent in building a godly, responsible life for the Lord. What are you doing with what you have? That's the question of, of stewardship. And in Psalm 90, verse 12, is such an, you ought to read this psalm because many of the psalms are written by David. This one is a prayer of Moses, the guy who was leading the millions of Jews to freedom, to the land of Canaan. You don't have verse 4. Let me read verse 4 to you. A thousand years in your sight, O Lord, are like a day just gone by. So the psalm, he's, Moses is in his mind starting to contemplate. Gosh, with you, time doesn't matter. And Jesus Christ stepped into time so that he could be with us because he was outside of time. And, and as Moses is working his way down this prayer, he's remembering, man, time is interesting from your perspective. Then he says, from our perspective, he says, if that is the way it is with you, he says, teach us to realize the brevity of life 
so that we may grow in wisdom. Teach us to count our days. Teach us to know how much time we have so that we have wisdom. What's wisdom? Wisdom in the scripture is living my life in God's way. Wisdom is God's wise way of living. Doing what I do, taking what I have, making sure that everything I do is for the Lord. You know, how do how do you get somebody? You know, this is a good prayer, isn't it? Because I'm not sure we often think about how much time we have, unless we've been diagnosed. And then people start to think about it, right? It's a it's a good prayer that you should pray often. How do how do I learn how short my life is on earth? Maybe it happens as you get a little older, like maybe Moses. That's where he's reflecting. You know, it's really difficult to get young people to stop and think, you know, about how much time they have, right? Uh, it's, it's why we send young men and women off to war. They think they'll live forever. They, they think they're untouchable, man. They, 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 they just have that vim and vigor. They have that, you know. I think to myself, the way you teach somebody that, you know, their, um, that their, their life is short, and is, I, I think about new kids learning how to drive in Northeast Ohio. You know, you're teaching a kid how to drive in Northeast Ohio. You're telling them, watch out for snow. You're telling them, listen, this is what you do when you get in snow. Watch for black ice. Watch when you drive over a, uh, a bridge. You know, watch when you're going around an S-curve. And you're trying to teach them all those things. But honestly, the best thing that helps a child, a, a kid, a teenager, learn how to drive and respect snow is a close call. I want them to get a close call that maybe they have to empty their shorts. I, uh, I would like them to have a close call, and I think about this. I, I'm not sure if I can say I prayed about it, but if you can have a close call and come out of it, whew, then you learn. Then you learn what it is about. I was driving down Route 2, and there was a, a young lady who ended up on top of a snow pile. Her car was sitting there almost like a cartoon, man. I, I stopped, her husband worked uh, in, in Chardon, took her there. You know, just, you just never know, but what will stick in her mind is the fact that she had a close call. How do we get to a place where we have a close call in life? Bad news that doesn't turn out to be so bad, or bad news that is bad? It's, it's it becoming this mindset that God wants us to have Maybe the best education for us in understanding our time is a close call. I hope it doesn't have to be, but we have to get in our mindset. I think that this is a wonderful, I don't know how this happens. I mean, teach us to realize how short our life is so that we can live it with wisdom. How, how does God answer that question? How do we get to the place where we realize? Because a lot of times the people that are alive, we think that we're going to be around forever. And all you have to do is go back 50 years, a lot of you weren't here. Go forward 50 years, a lot more of us won't be here. Teach me to understand time so I can navigate you know, uh, the responsibilities and the free gifts of life that you've given to me in my time. Be careful not to say these words. Lord, I'm going to carve out some time for you. What? I'm going to carve out some time for you? No. You don't want to say those words. God is all in all. And that's why, uh, if I could just hit these with you again, you know, uh, these are the five principles that Jesus taught. These are the five principles or disciplines or practices that we constantly talk about here. On an ongoing basis, we talk about them. Because the person who says, I need to carve out some time for you, to me, that's a picture of somebody who's lukewarm. Take a look at all five of these. The first one is the Bible, right? We start with the scriptures. You need to start with this. Everything else on this list comes after you start reading the scriptures. After you start making sure every day you have a time with the Lord. You open up the scriptures. You find something to read in God's word so you learn to hear from the Holy Spirit who inspired them. The second thing is, is you either lead a study or you're in a study. You have to be in a study. If you're a teacher and you understand the word and that's the gift God's given you, you have a responsibility to be a teacher. If not, you need to be in a study where there is somebody who has the gift of teaching and can open up the scriptures and help you know how to live it. 
I invite you out on Wednesday night, 6.45 for an hour. The second thing is prayer. I think, you know, many people pray before they uh, read the Bible, because I know I did. But you don't always know what to pray. Uh, the Scriptures tells us constantly, it's teaching, you know, it's okay to pray, you know, while you're driving and people say that. But are you going to basically say that God, the only time you're going to carve out any time for God <laughs> is when you're driving or when you're doing some other activity? Because you want to be a, you, you want to really make sure that all of your time is really, you know, you, you're managing your time good. I, I challenge you, if, you, if that's the only time, stop it. Start getting some time alone with the Lord. Prayer. The third is serving. You have gifts. We have a gift, uh, a ministry here. I talked to, I talked to a young couple this past week. I uh, talked to them. They gave their life to Christ last Sunday. And I uh, talked to them about getting involved in a connection ministry, finding out who God made them to be and created them to be. You know, anybody here can see Jill. Raise your hand. And you can get involved in the, uh, you can go through the connection ministry. Have you done it before? Yeah, maybe five years ago. But if you want to be a part of Life, Lifeline, go through the connection ministry. We'll get to know you. You get to know us. And uh, we'll plug you in where Jesus Christ has gifted you. And if you think about it, if it wasn't for people serving, you wouldn't have church today. Number four is giving. You know, learning what it means to give. Learning, we love our money so much. Learning what it means to tithe. You know, the biblical principle of tithing, of sowing seed. You know, who determines what I give to the Lord? Me or him? And some of you, you started the process. I get it, you know. Let, let me start at, uh, tithe is 10%. Let me start at 2%. Let me work at, but isn't it time for somebody here to say, I know this principle. It's time for me to trust the Lord with my giving. And then number five is fellowship, right? One of the things as we talked about this in design team, they said, you know, people just don't realize what they're missing. To stick around and talk, take 10 minutes, see if they can help somebody or somebody can help them. It's fellowship. It's what we do. We're getting ready to have a, an evening of prayer. I can't remember when it is, but after prayer, we are going to try to do everything we can to get you out there. Therefore, we're having the King Cone ice cream truck come. And if you don't show up for prayer... No ice cream, just like your daddy. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not, like, I'm not going to stop. I mean, we use a timer to play board games, right? Pictionary, whatever else it is out there. We're cooking. We put a timer on. We turn an hourglass over. We got so much sand running out. And, folks, the truth is, is the sand is falling through the hourglass in my life and in yours. Teach us, Lord, to count our time, our days. Help us, Father God, to understand the brevity of life. And that picture is a word for short, your short life. What are you doing with the time to honor the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, I have in your notes there the phrase net worth, and you can figure your net worth out, right? You can find out how much your home is worth, what you got in your savings, your retirement, all kinds of pension plan. You can come up with a number. You got a number, you're worth $100,000, you are worth 10 bucks, whatever it might be. You can find out your net worth. But you also have a net worth to God. You have a net worth to God. You know, you have been given the free gift of life, and with that life comes responsibility. You have a net worth of your time, and people are God's greatest resource. God's greatest resource is not only the minerals, it's people. He has always done things with people, and he's wanting to do something with you and me. That's what's going to make Lifeline Church dynamic. It's not what the pastor can do. It's what we can do. That's what Sandy so, so wonderfully painted a picture of. In your notes, God has made you the steward of valuable assets. He has made you the steward of valuable assets. You know, I know somebody who uh, owns an uh, apartment complex, right? You have an apartment complex. Maybe it has 50 apartments in it. You hire somebody to take care of it. Well, you go off and do whatever you want to do. You're managing that apartment complex. You're overseeing somebody else's property. I mean, a steward manages someone else's property. You are a steward all throughout the scripture. One of the things that was really great to me was learning that I'm a steward of my children. They're not mine. You would think I would have thought and known that, but they're not mine. And oftentimes, the one thought that you and I need more than anything else is God loves your kids more than you do. So we'll then pay for college. <laughs> you have a life. You have a life. You have responsibilities. You have time, but it's not your own. 
You have been purchased at, with a price. There's nothing in your coffin that you're going to take with you. Nothing. I watch a TV show called Life Below Zero. And they just love the fact that uh, they can live off on their own. They're up in Alaska. They're by the North Pole. They're doing it. They, uh, they, they just love the fact that they don't have to rely on anybody, you know, down in the 48 states and don't have to rely on equipment and then they pull out their chainsaw, you know, whatever. So if you're really about it, why don't you just vuba, vuba, you know. And I think to myself every time I watch that show, could that possibly be? pleasing and honoring to God, to say to myself, I'm just going to be by myself. I'm going to learn how to survive all by myself. I'm not going to affect anybody. Nobody's going to affect me. And there's no way that I could think that that would possibly, possibly honor the Lord. So I ask you today, we're getting ready to take the Lord's Supper, Tom, if you want to come. You know, God wants you to use your assets. He wants you to see and understand that you have valuable assets. You have a moral choice to make right today. You have a free will. And that's why many, many people do not honor the Lord with their life. They don't honor the Lord with their life because they basically say, this is my life, and God's given them that freedom. And God's given that freedom to you and to me today. As we take the Lord's Supper, and go ahead whenever you're ready, Tom, is I read something, and I'll just put it in the words as best that I can. Life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely and pretty and well preserved and in great shape though that's not a bad thing that's not a bad thing life should be the type of life that it's an all out sprint to the end an all out sprint to the end ending in a slide going into home base with a cloud of dust thoroughly used up totally worn out and loudly proclaiming wow what a ride I look at the life of Jesus Christ. Thoroughly used up. Totally worn out. Loudly proclaiming, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. If you need the Lord's Supper, if you don't have one of these cups and you would like it, if you just raise your hand, Tracy will make sure you get that. This is a little tricky, especially for men. There's a little piece of foil or a clear plastic that's got to come off the top of this to get to the... uh, to get to the bread. Anybody else need one? You got to just pull that little piece off the top there. Maybe today you want to take the Lord's Supper for the very first time, making a commitment that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Maybe you've been here, you've been hearing about it, but what about today before taking this? And if you don't want to take it today because you're not sure you're Christian, that's fine. I, I, I did the same thing for a while. Take the time, just take a minute, bow your head, let the Holy Spirit examine your heart. Maybe there's something you need to do before you take this. Tom, if you'll just go ahead. name of Jesus means he saves. If you're a Christian today, take this and this represents the body of Christ. But if today you believe in the resurrection, maybe you believed all that like I did for 20 some years in your head, but it's not in your heart. And you taking this today says, I believe he saves, but I believe he saves me. And you're going to turn from your sins today and you're going to ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. Take this now with that remembrance and that dedication to him.
Second Corinthians, or is it First Corinthians or Second Corinthians 11, where it talks about um, doing this in remembrance of Christ until He comes again. We believe Jesus is coming again. Will you take this juice? It represents the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It represents the blood of Jesus, which was shed from the beginning of the founding of of, of Israel to help people see and understand that this blood would forgive sins it covered over and then jesus the book of hebrews says he was sacrificed once for all never needed again aren't you glad if nothing if jesus gave you nothing else aren't you glad that by his blood your sins can be forgiven take and drink father as we uh remember what it is that you've done for us as we remember today that um you call us to make sure that we do what we know we need to do with what you've given to us, the free gift of life and everything in and around us, that we did nothing, and you created the skills and abilities that you've given us to hone. You made us responsible for those, and you're helping us to understand your life is shorter than you think. Today, Father God, may every one of us here Make a commitment to the one thing that you spoke to us today about. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. A couple quick announcements as we're running a little over. Uh, on June second, 6th, sorry, we'll be celebrating our graduates here at Lifeline um, and Lifeline's ninth anniversary with cake. So if you're a graduate or have a graduate in your family that's high school, college, or trade school, please fill out the Aqua communication card. They're in front of your seats right there. Um, and write legibly the name of the graduate, the school they're graduating from, and place it in the given basket on the way out on that back table over there. There is a flyer in the program this week for the Summer Kids Club called Treasured. It's right there. You can see. Um, the pro- this program run about will run from June 9th to August 11th. It's about 10 weeks. Um, it's on Wednesdays from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Kind of coincides with our current um, schedule with um, Bible study. So if you've got kids or you have neighborhood kids or anything like that, um, we'd like to get them signed up. But this week our focus is on getting volunteers for that. Um, great sermon to come off of that, um, volunteering um, in your time. Bonnie will work with you if you are like, oh, you know, I'm off on vacation a certain time or week. Um, but again, 10 weeks, um, if you got more than five weeks of vacation on a Wednesday this summer, uh, let me apply to your job. But um, just come out, try and help, um, be there for the kids. Um, spreading the message in the gospel does not take a summer vacation. So we need you guys there. We need help. Um, It's going to be a new, fun program that we're trying to get through. Next week, we are going to be taking registrations online for that program. And also in the foyer, there's a brand new um, board that they put together, which is a wish board. So it's a list of donations and supplies that we need for this upcoming event. Um, Take a look at it. I believe what you do is there's a bunch of different little cards on there. You can sign up for what you want to take, like say it's a box of crayons. Put your name down to say what you took take that card with you, and then when you come back, just kind of attach that card. If you don't have the card with you, I guess it's not that big of a deal, but um, bring back those supplies so we can get that started and start to collect the things that we need to make this program successful. Men's breakfast is Saturday, June 5th at 8 a.m. It's almost at (laughs) p.m. In the Hero Cafe, if you plan on attending, please sign up in the Welcome Center. For more information, contact Tom. He was just up here playing the guitar great time again for men to fellowship and edify each other if you need any more information we've got a whole list of things that are coming up and things to look forward to reference that Um, if you're a guest with us today we have a great little cup and mug and a little bit about who we are here for you you can go to the welcome center for that as well 
please pick up your children, stick around. Again, the word fellowship for today with some people. Encourage, lift somebody up, and have a great rest of your Sunday.